Hi everyone and welcome back to my series of tutorials on Introduction to R. As a reminder, these tutorials follow along with a blog post I've written, which can be found on my website. And I have my website opened up here, so all we have to do is go to blogs, and here's the Introduction to R blog. Okay, so in the first video, I went through getting everything installed and getting familiar with R Studio. And in the second video, I introduced Tidyverse. So now in this video, that leaves going through my workflow. In order to show you, I've chosen a specific research question that we'll go through. As you can see on my blog, the research question we'll explore today is which countries won the most medals at the Tokyo Olympics? So as an overview, we'll, we'll first go through how to download the data and then in an R Markdown script, we'll load in the libraries, we'll read in the data, then clean our data, and finally visualize our results. So this is what the final results will look like. Throughout this video, I'll provide little tips and tricks on how I do data analysis in R. Some of the tips I may have pointed out before in the past videos, but I think it will be super useful to see again as a reminder and also nice to see just how everything comes together here. All right, so let's get started by opening up our studio. And actually the very first thing I'll show you is just a few settings that I like to change within our studio. And now everything that I do here is just my personal preference. So feel free to change these as you wish. But it, we go to tools and global options. The first thing in this R general tab, there's an option to save the workspace to a dot R data on exit. And it by default, it's set to ask you, which means that every time you close out of R studio, it will ask if you want to save your workspace. And your workspace is just anything that you have in your global environment. I recommend, I always just turn this off to never because I save my scripts and that's really all that I need. I don't need to save the global environment variables. I also like to uncheck these three boxes here because I don't want to restore any of my past projects that I was just working on. When I open up our studio, I want a fresh workspace so I can start whatever project I'm working on for the day. Okay, so that's what I like to do with the first tab. In appearance, I personally like working with a darker background. So they have all these different cool themes that you can go look through and see which one you like. I, this is the one I like, Tomorrow Night Bright, so I will choose that. And then finally, because we will be working with our markdown, just a couple of settings here. The first one, there's an option to show output preview in either the win a new window that will pop up, but I prefer to have it just in the viewer pane. So rather than a brand new window, it will just pop up in the viewer pane over here. And finally, I'm going to uncheck this box here, show output inline for all our markdown documents. I just prefer to see all the output directly in the console. So I have, I uncheck this, but again, this is all up to you. Please do make sure to click apply. So all of your settings will be saved and okay. Okay, so now we're ready to get started working on our research question. So as this is a new project, of course, the very first thing we want to do is create a new project, which is nice and easy to remember. So we can go to the project button and new project. And I'll just, let me see if I can quickly show you just on my desktop. Right now, my desktop is completely blank. So I want to create a folder where this project will be located or will be stored directly on my desktop. So to do that, I'm going to click new directory and new project. So let's title this workflow. And you can see it's already set to be saved on my desktop but please do make sure to browse and select the location you wish your project will be saved. 
So once you have that, we can create the project. And now we can even see in the top corner, it says uh, the project is called Workflow. So that's great. And now I'm actually just going to close out of this so you can see we did create this folder called Workflow just by doing that. And when I open it, now we can see there's just one file. We won't worry about this .r history, but there is one file that is an R project and you can recognize it by this little R cube. And so now whenever I work on this project in the future, rather than trying to go and open up our studio and navigate to the right place, I can just go straight here, click on this and it will open up. So that's really awesome. And now my working directory is all set and I'm ready to go. Okay, so let's just go back to the blog and I'll scroll up here. Okay, so as I said, this is the our research question that we'll be trying to answer. But the, of course, before we even can do anything else, we have to get our data. So I have chosen a data set from this website called Kaggle. And this website's awesome. There are so many different cool uh, free data sets that you can explore. I have chosen this data set on the 2021 Olympics in Tokyo because I love sports and I definitely always watch the Olympics when they're on. All right, so all we have to do is click the download button. And now if you've never used Kaggle before, it is free, but you will, I believe you do have to create a free account. Uh, I think I actually just logged in straight with my Google account, so it should be pretty easy to do. Okay, so let's open this. So just by opening it, you can see there are a few different data sets within this whole um, data project. But for this project, all we want is the metals. So I'm going to minimize out of here. And here we have my workflow. One thing I like to do to keep my project really organized is whenever I have my data, I create a new folder called data. So this makes it really easy uh, to know exactly where my data is being stored. Okay, so I've just moved the metals there. Now I will rename this because I really don't like working with capital letters. Everything I do will always have lowercase. And, and then we don't need this anymore. Okay, so we do have our data, but I can actually see right here that this is saved as a Microsoft Excel worksheet. Now, there are ways that you can definitely read in uh, Microsoft Excel worksheets within R, but I typically try to use uh, what's called a CSV file. So I'll show you, all I'm going to do is open up the Excel doc, and this is really nice if you're more familiar with using Excel. Here you can kind of see, get a sense of what your data looks like. But I just want to open this because I'm going to save it as a CSV file. So rather than this Excel file, we're going to scroll down and just choose CSV. And this is just something that I typically do. I find it really easy to read in and work with CSV files in R. All right, so we'll just save this and now we can close. I will keep the CSV file and get rid of this one just so there's no confusion. Okay, so now we have that. Let's go back to our studio. And so now we can actually see already in our studio, it's, we can see that we have our data folder and we can see we have our metals uh, data set. All right, so now we can close out of this. Let's, so the next thing we have to do is start working on our script. And of course, the first thing that we'll do there is load in the library. So let's start a new R Markdown. So we can go here and go uh, click on R Markdown. We'll also title this metals just to keep it consistent. And okay. So this has just changed the title here. Do note that we still have to actually save our work, so we can click save, and again, we'll just save it as metals. And if we go back to our workflow, 
this has saved it in our root working directory. So here we can see we have our metals.rmd. So if we close out of this, it's very easy to just open it back up and continue working where we left off. All right, so I always will keep this first R chunk within the R markdown, but we'll get rid of everything else. And so this is the setup, which kind of tells you what the global options for all of your R chunks are. And I always add a couple here. So warning and message, I set them equal to false. And I'll just show you why in one minute. And now, so now we have our R markdown set up. We do wanna, I always start off with um, loading in my libraries. So load in libraries. And now to create an R chunk on a Windows at least, it's we can do Control Alt I. And I'll just make this a little bit bigger. So now the lo the libraries I know that I need for this project will be Tidyverse. There's one called Janitor. And finally, one of my personal favorites, GG Easy. And I will point out here, you can see as I start typing, there is the suggested package here. So that's a really good indication that you already have this package installed because R recognizes it. Of course, if you've never used one of the packages before, you will have to install the package. And as a reminder, you can just do install packages. You need to put quotes and then Put your package name in. So this is the one-time thing you can you can do it straight in your console, and then you still every time you open up a new R session, you do have to load in the library. But note you do not need the quotes here. So we can run all of these lines just by clicking this button here and running the current chunk. Okay, so. Here we can see all of the libraries are loaded in, but there are a few different warning messages. So if we, just to show you what I've done up here, I will actually remove this and knit the file. And you'll note with my settings, now it will pop up in the viewer pane, the knitted file. Okay. So, so here we can see we have the title, metals, we've loaded in the libraries, but we get all these different warnings here. And in a final report, we don't want to see all these warnings. So if I just put the warning equals false back in, I save my work and I re -knit, we will take a look and see what this looks like. All right, so this is much cleaner, right? We can just easily see all the libraries we loaded with out all of the warnings. So that's why I always start off by putting in uh, uh, these extra arguments in the, these, the setup options here. And of course, as you're going and working on a script, sometimes you'll discover packages that you need along the way. That's awesome. I do that all the time. But when that happens, I'll always come back and add the packages, add the libraries to this very first R chunk here, just so that I keep everything organized and it's the first chunk of code that will run. So all of the packages will be loaded in at the very start. Okay, so next we want to uh, read in our data. So let's go back to files. And remember we have a folder that's called data and then our data. Oh, another really cool thing. Let's just, I'll make this a little bit bigger. There's this button up top here. This is an outline feature. So if you click on this, you can see that you're, you can create an outline as you type and as you build your script. So right now I'm writing read in data. And this is really handy because in order to create the outline, all you have to do is have headers. So 
we can navigate to our document based on our headers. Okay, so I'll just keep this open so you can kind of see how it works as I can as we go through. There are quite a few ways that you can read in your data. I'll just show you my uh, the way that I typically do it and show you one other alternative that I've seen more and more people are starting to do. So I will use a read underscore CSV function. You can see this is from the read R package, which is part of Tidyverse. And then I'll just in quotes, I'll start typing the data set that I want to read in. And I know I've it's called metals and I will click tab. And now you can see all the different options of the files that I have as metals. But this is the one that I want because I know that this is my data file. So as soon as I click this, you can see it's actually um, changed what I have typed here. So it's added in this data and this slash. So this is saying that you have to go in the data folder and then you'll be able to find the metals.csv file. So now if we run this line of code, you can see that it has worked. We have printed our data here. When Now, when I started to code, I didn't even know about Tidyverse, so all I knew was there was another similar function that's called read.csv, and I'll just show you this to compare because this, uh, this will work, but you can see it's actually printed out 93 rows, so, and in order to see the header, you have to scroll all the way to the top. So here, now you can see the variable names. So it's a little bit less convenient. And this is really why I choose to always use the Tidyverse version of it. So read underscore. So again, just to compare, now we can see it only prints out the first 10 rows. We can see the name, the variable names, and it's really cool because it also shows you the type of variables. So a double character and so on. And because it's tidyverse, it will automatically read in your data as a tibble, which is a type of data frame, but it has some really cool features that makes it easy to read and easy to work with. So here we can quickly see that there are 93 rows and seven variables. And, and another cool thing is if not everything fits on the screen, it will tell you there's actually one more variable, which is called rank by total. And even here, it tells you the type of variable. Now, I purposely made my screen a little bit small, so this would happen. But if we just expand it a little bit more and now do this one more time, we can see all of the rows, all of the variable names fit on our screen, so it's easy to see. Okay, so that's great. And of course, now we do want to save this to a variable. So I'm going to call this metals raw because this is our raw data. We haven't done anything to it yet. Okay, so now let's run this. And we can just take a look once more and see this is our raw data. Okay, great. And I will just quickly show out in my blog, I mentioned there is a here package that does help read reading in your data. So to do that, it's pretty similar. You can just do read underscore CSV, but we'll use a special function called here from the here package. And now pretty much you just have to specify you want to go inside the data folder and then there will be the metals.csv. So you can see this prints out the exact same thing. Uh, so this is just kind of um, a, another alternative way, but it accomplishes the exact same thing. So I'll comment it out because we only need one. All right, great. Let's go back to the blog. Um, oh, I do want to point out, if you are interested in learning more about the HERE package, there is a really great resource I have on my blog that you can just go to right here. Okay, great. So now we want to work on cleaning our data. I think this part is 
really fun and maybe the most challenging, but very, very rewarding. Okay, so here we can watch our outline because I have a hashtag, it will be a header. So clean our data. So in order to clean our data, we will rely on Tidyverse to help us out. And the first thing we want to do is start with, of course, our data. And we will be using the pipe a lot. Uh, I know on Windows, at least, that there's a shortcut where you can do Control Shift M and it will create the pipe for you. So now we have to think about what, how do we want to clean our data? And the first thing I always look at is the variable names. And straight away, I see a few problems with how the these variables are named. For example, as I mentioned before, I really don't like working with capital letters. So that's one thing I noticed. There's also some special characters that I we would want to get rid of. And probably the biggest thing is this variable name has some white space, which we always want to try, try to avoid using when programming. Fortunately, all of these problems can be solved with one amazing function called clean names. This is from the janitor package, which of course we have already loaded in. So, so now again, just look at the variable names here and with this one line of code, you can check this out. Now it's all clean, there are no many, there's no special characters, even the white space has now been replaced by underscore. So that looks really, really good to me and I'm much happier working with these variables now. Okay, just quickly before moving on, I did want to point this out because I almost forgot. There's, there's one function called view. Although we do get a really good sense of what our data looks like in our console, if you want to see the full view of it, we can just type in our data here and this will open up a new window. So now you can see this has popped up and we can scroll and see our the entire data set here. So we, we don't really ever have to open up that CSV file anymore outside of our studio because we can see the full data set right here. And sometimes, of course, there'll be data sets with dozens or even hundreds of variables. And if so, there'll be an option where you can uh, click on the arrow to navigate between pages and see all of the different variables. But for us, there's only, um, there are not that many variables, so it's easy to see everything on one page. All right. Okay, so now getting back to cleaning our data. Now that we have the clean names, I'm actually going to save this as a new variable. I, I believe in my blog, I've kind of put all of the tidying together into one sequence of um, pipes. But for here, for this tutorial, well, I think it'll be easier to save this as a new var variable. So we'll call this metals clean because we've just cleaned the names. Oops. All right. Okay, so now we're going to, again, start with this data set. And now the next thing I do, now that we have our clean names, I like to try to condense the data set down so it's really much easier to work with and to see the variables that I am interested in. So let's just go back and remind ourselves of our research question. I'm going to copy this and just paste it here. So we need to know the countries and the number of metals. So we don't really need all of these variables. And so I'm going to only select the variables that we need. So we want the teams. I think NOC is the nation of the committee. So we want team. And you can see once I start typing, R is very smart and it can it will make suggestions and you can click enter and fill it in for you. So we want the teams and the total medals. I will point out that it's really important that you spell everything correctly here. Even if we 
if I just did a capital instead, we'll, we will get an error saying total doesn't exist. So be very careful about your spelling. Okay, so now it, it's much easier to kind of read and work with this because we only have the information that we truly need to answer our research question. And so now we're getting really close, but we do, it would be really helpful if we have this arranged in an order so we can see who has the most medals to who has the fewest medals. And fortunately, there's a function for everything. And I know that there is one function called arrange, and we um, want to arrange it by total. So if I just do this, and now I always do this because I always forget, you can see it's actually arranged it from fewest to most. So we can easily add one function called des descending. And now we can see it's in order from the most to the fewest. Okay, that's awesome. And the final pipe that I'll add, this is something that, a function that I've recently discovered. It's part of the dplyr package. It's called top underscore n. And if we just specify five here, you can see it only prints out the top five rows of our data. And uh, if you remember, this is all we wanted. We just wanted the top five countries who won the most medals. So right here, we have our, our answer to our uh, research question. We have the top five countries. But now, of course, we also want to save this. Let's do metals top five. I believe that's the same name that I used on my blog. Okay, and now if we, we can even just look at it in the console and we have it printed out here. All right, that's, that's great. And now let's take a look, make sure I haven't skipped over anything, loading libraries, reading data, cleaning our data. So it's pretty cool, right? We just cleaned our data in one, two, three, four, five, or in our case, we had a couple extra lines, but less than 10 lines of code. Okay, so now for the very fun part, visualizing our results. Um, to do this, we will use ggplot. And I do want to take a moment to point out something that might be a little bit confusing because if you remember, of course, we were using the pipe with tidyverse. So we did step one, pipe, step two, pipe, step three, pipe, and so on. ggplot is similar because you're adding, you're kind of adding steps as you go, but you'll notice that we're, we use the uh, plus sign instead of the pipe here. So it can be a little bit confusing when you're going back and forth from piping to using ggplot. And one way I like to think about it as, is that you're adding a new layer to your plot. So each line, you're adding a new layer. So think of it adding plus sign. That's how I like to remember it. All right, so so this is the code that we'll, work, we'll write together and this will be the output that we end up with. So here we can come back and start a new section for visualize our results. And I'll just make a quick note using ggplot, or actually this could be a cool time to point out. Our outline, you can even add kind of like subsections so you can see how it's now indented here. Um, so that's pretty cool. But I'm just going to change this to this will end up being a bullet point in our markdown. All right, so, so I always use ggplot these days for creating my graphs and visualizations just because there's so much flexibility, there's so many different types of plots that you can create, you know, a line graph, bar graph, a histogram, there's so many different things you can do. So whenever you're working with ggplot, you want to start off with the ggplot function. Now, the first thing we see is that we want to enter in our data, which we have saved as metals 
top five. And then I just click tab so you can see the different arguments. And I know the second one is mapping and you have to specify your, the AES, which stands for aesthetics. And here you can see you have to specify your X and Y. So this, so this is really telling your plot what do you want on your X axis and what do you want on your Y axis. So for us, we want to have the team or the country on the X, which we have as team underscore NOC, and the Y, we want the total medals. Okay, great. Let's make this bigger because we'll be seeing the plot. Now I just want to show you what happens if we try to run this uh, ggplot as it is. We can see we do get a plot on our in our viewer or in our plot screen here, but it's not very helpful at the moment. All it has is our two axes. And that's because we haven't actually told um, we haven't actually told it what type of plot we wish to create. So this is where the layers come in handy. So now we want to add a layer and here we're going to create a column graph or a column, which is similar to a bar graph, but we'll use um, a geom underscore function. And here you can see all the different types of plots that you can create. They all, uh, I believe they do all start with geom. And so there's some of the more common ones, geom point, geom line, um, geom uh, histogram, I think, box plot I use a lot. Anyway, you get carried away at looking at all of them, but I know the one that we want to use now is geom call. And now you can specify more specific aesthetics if you want, but because we've kind of put it in this global layer, so this is kind of like the aesthetics for the entire plot. So now all we have to do is run this again and let's see what happens. So just like that, we have now, we now have our bar plot. Okay, so what do we notice here? This is a great start, but it's definitely, it definitely still needs some work. So the first thing I notice that uh, is particularly concerning and a little bit hard to read, we can't read the names here. So one trick here, we can do a function called chord flip. And now I'll do control enter and run this. And now we can see it's just flipped. So now the X is over here and the Y is down here. And just and this just makes it easy to read the names now. But it's important to note that our X variable is still the country and our Y variable is still the total. So for example, if we want to change the labels because you know people might not understand what team underscore NOC is, we can do labs is a function and we can set X equals country and Y equals total metals. Okay, and now we can see that just change the labels here. There is also another argument, you can do title. Um, top five countries or something like that. So I don't often put in a title, but that is just one argument that you can specify here. Okay, I'll leave that out for now. Uh, the next thing I usually do is I, I change the theme of my graph. I don't particularly like this gray background of the plot. So there are a lot of different themes that you can check out. As soon as you start typing it, you can see them all here. So I'll just choose one. Let's just see what this gray does. That didn't really change too much, did it? I, I know there's one that's called dark which I don't particularly like that either. So my go-to is BW, which stands for black, white, I think, at least. Okay, so now if we do that, I just like that. It looks clean and I tend to use this one all the time. So now, of course, one thing I don't, you know, it's not the prettiest, it's all gray. So let's add some color to our plot. To do this, we'll go into our aesthetics function here and we'll add in a fill. 
So this will fill in the shape that we have here and we wanna fill it by the teams. Okay, so let's just take a quick uh, look at this, make it a little bit bigger and easy to read. So this has definitely added color, but we'll note a couple of things here. First of all, it's automatically added this legend. And of course, a lot of times you will want and need the legends in order to interpret what's going on in your plot. But for us, this is a little bit redundant because we have all the informa information on our plot. So I'm going to show you, this is where the GG Easy package comes into play. And with the GG Easy package, there are a ton of functions that start with the word easy, right? So you can see these are all part of the GG Easy package. And these functions are all kind of like helper functions to make working with ggplot a little bit easier and just like shortcuts to help you do things in just one line of code. So because I've done this so many times, I know that there's a function called easy remove legend. So I've just started typing easy remove and now I can just click this. And just like that, I now have gotten rid of the legend. Just one more example of a GG easy function. There's an easy text size. So, you know, this will probably be way too big, but we can change the text size to 30 and you can't read that at all. So let's just go down to 15. And um, it makes it a little bit easier to read, especially if it's going to be um, saved somewhere uh, or as part of a final report. Oh, one thing to point out here, the, this fill option or argument we needed because we have uh, a, like a bar graph and it's a shape. A lot of times if you want to add color, for example, if you have geo and point and they're just individual points, you'll use a color argument instead. Sometimes I'll forget and I'll just put color in, but we can just take a look and see all this has done, has, it has done a little outline to the shape. So when that happens, you just say, oh yes, I actually meant to do the fill. Okay, I think the very last thing that I wanna to do to this graph is try to get the uh, countries in order from most metals to fewest metals, just because that makes it much easier to read and interpret our final plot. Okay, and to do this, we'll go back up to our aesthetics again. And with our X variable, we're just going to add a function here it's called reorder. And now we want to reorder this variable by the total and sum, and the sum of that. So now I spelled total wrong. Uh, let's try that again. Okay, so now you can see it has reordered them and that looks really, really good. So now we have our final visualization. And so let's just take a quick look at everything that we've done. We've loaded in our libraries. Oh, and we can even navigate here. We read in our data, cleaned our data, and finally visualized our results. So I'm gonna save the work and as a final step, I will knit our markdown file. Okay, and I will show you that at the very top, this will, out, it has it outputting it as an HTML document. You do have other options, but I typically tend to use this. And you can view it in our viewer pane, but we can also open it up in a new window if you just want the full to see it on a full screen and and here you can also see it's a dot html okay so here we have all of our code all of our headers even some notes that we've left for ourselves, and finally our beautiful graph so that looks really really awesome and let's just take a quick look back Make sure we haven't missed anything, but I think that looks good. I think that looks great. Okay, so the only thing that's left on my blog is 
I have created this ggplot challenge. I thought this would be a really fun way to end my blog by giving all of you a bit of a challenge to test out your new R skills and ggplot skills. The goal here is for you to take a look at this plot that I've created using the exact same data set that we just worked on and try to reproduce this graph. Now it is a little bit more complicated, but I think that's part of the fun of it. So just do the best that you can. And I will record a very short final tutorial going through and coding this graph so you can see how I get, we get, or how we can reproduce this plot. So I hope you enjoy this video. Thank you so much for watching and look forward to seeing you next time.